you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. Judges, chapter number 7. And there's this guy named Gideon. And Gideon is leading the Israelite army. And Gideon doesn't really feel qualified to do what he's called to do. Anybody ever been there before? Called but not qualified. He doesn't feel qualified to do what he's called to do. And he has a group of 32,000 soldiers with him that are ready to fight this battle against a group called the Midianites. Now, the Midianites were admittedly a formidable force. Okay, they had so many more people than Gideon and the Israelites did. Gideon had 32,000. He knew that wasn't enough, so he goes to God in Judges chapter 7. He goes to him and he says, listen, God, I need some help. And God offers advice and some help that you might not expect when you already don't have enough of something. He offers the opposite of what Gideon would have wanted to hear. In Judges 7, verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. God tells an army that's already outnumbered, You have too many men. Have you ever had a time in your life where you cried out to God and he gave you an answer that was literally the complete opposite of what you went to him for? Where you prayed and sought God for an answer that you knew would solve everything. God, if I could have more men, we're outnumbered. Thanks for the 32,000. That's cool. But God, if we could have more, then we might have a chance. And God says, you have too many men. No, if you've ever gone to God for an answer, and instead it seemed like he gave you another problem. You've gone to God for a solution, and instead it seemed like he gave you Something that just muddied the water a little bit. I believe that God loves to test us and to test our faith because if he just gave us the answer that we sought for in the moment, that doesn't take a whole lot of faith. If we pray and seek God and immediately the answer is there exactly how we thought it would look, that doesn't take a lot of faith. And a lot of times we can begin to think that we did that thing. So God will tell us something that doesn't make any sense at all. He tells Gideon, he's like, hey, you got too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. Two-thirds gone. Just like that. God's like, whoop. Two-thirds gone. If you're scared... If you're afraid, go home. Easy way out. And 22,000 men are like, that's my cue. That's my cue. I'm out. I've been just waiting for somebody to ask me just to let me know it was okay. I'm going to just picture like one person like sliding out and then the next person's like, oh, he's going, okay, cool. Oh, third person, okay, cool. You know, and, and it's the fear of man and like all these people are going out. And so it's like, sweet, it's okay. 22,000. Out of 32,000. But the Lord said to Gideon, surely he tells him this this isn't the right number of men, right? Says, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out for you there. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. And there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues as a dog laps from those who kneel down to drink. 300 of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink, and the Lord said to Gideon, I'm laughing because this is just, I mean, it's really comical. With the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the others go home. I love this. I love it because I love a challenge. And I can picture in this moment, I can imagine the response out of 99 of 100 people. Maybe 100 out of 100, truly. If you're in this moment, I mean, imagine this, picture this. Gideon already feels like he's not able to do what God has called him to do. He feels unprepared to do what God has called him to do. He doesn't feel like he has what it takes. Gideon has 32,000 men, and he still feels outnumbered. 
So he goes to God. That seems like the logical thing to do. That seems like what you would want to do. You have a problem, you go to God for a solution. He goes to God feeling outnumbered, feeling incapable, unqualified. And he says, God, I got 32,000 men and I'm facing this massive army. I need help. And God says, tell anyone who's afraid to go home. And just like that, 22,000 are gone. Just like that. So, so, Gilead's, or, uh, so, so Gideon's like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, right, deep breaths. Many of us have been doing this all year this year. Just, it's okay. It's going to be okay. Gideon's like, I got, I got 10,000 men left. We're going to make this work. It's going to be okay. And then God's like, you still have too many. Like, now you've kind of gone too far, God. Now you're kind of pushing the envelope a little bit, saying, I still have too many. But it's God. So you got to obey. So he's like, okay, whatever. So God said, have them drink the right way. 300 men are left. After all of this, the answer that God gave Gideon for not having enough men was to give him even less men. Not only does he have less men, he has a whole lot less men. Let me put it to you in something that maybe is easier to kind of grasp. Imagine that you had $32,000 and all of a sudden you had three hundred, dollars And you had a massive bill due. Not a good look. We're not jumping up and down and celebrating. He had 32,000 men. Now he has 300. And it's amazing because God did the complete opposite of what Gideon asked him to do. He did the complete opposite of what Gideon went to him for in the first place. And many times in our lives, God gives us an answer different than what we expected. And I wonder if you've ever been in a place where you felt like what you had wasn't enough to do what God was calling you to do. I wonder if you've ever been in a place where, where God called you to something but when you looked at what you had to work with, you felt like it wasn't enough. God, I need more people. God, I need more education. God, I need more resources. I need more in order to do what you're calling me to do. So I want to talk to you as we close out this series, First Things First, on the subject, when what you have isn't enough. When what you have isn't enough. Enough. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today, and we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for those who are here today, those who are also joining us online. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to hear from you today. Help each and every one of us in our hearts to be open and receptive to what you have to say today. Lord, I pray that you would help us to apply what you speak into our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would help no one to see or hear from me, but to see and hear from you. And Lord, I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Everybody said? Amen. 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 Now, how many of you would say, by a show of hands, because I want some interaction this morning, just get some energy flowing in the room, because I am in a flannel shirt. I'm already perspiring quite strongly. I was telling the worship team earlier today, I was like, I just want fall here. And our wonderful guy on the keys, James, goes, I'm like, I'm just trying to get to fall, and he's like, well, fall ain't ready for you. And I'm like, well, thanks for that. But I'm bringing it in anyways. So some interaction this morning. How many of you, by show of hands, would say that you are a picky eater? Anybody's a picky eater? Okay, thank you. I can relate. How many of you would say that you just kind of eat anything? Like if it's put in front of you, you're going to eat it. You're going to eat absolutely. Okay, pray for y'all. Because I am, I am definitely a picky eater. Now, with that said, I am willing to try something once. I don't like to. But I'm willing to do it, especially if I'm at, you know, somewhere else and, and somebody else has cooked. I'm not going to be rude. I'm going to eat it. I'm going to push through it. It's going to be okay. But I really don't like to try new things, especially if I'm paying for it. Because then I'm, I know I'm not going to like it, so I'm going to be hungry and I'm losing money on it. So anytime I go out to eat, I get my staples, Right, I get the ones that I know that I like. My picky people can relate. I get my chicken fingers. I get my cheeseburger. I get my steak. I get my tacos. And I get all of those things completely plain. Like plain. I don't want nothing on them. 
When I go to the sub shop, they're always, sub shop, what is that? When I go to like Jersey Mike's, Publix, any of those places, they're always like, okay, what do you want on your sub? And I'm like, turkey and cheese. Okay, what do you want on top of it? No, I'm good, man. Thanks. This is the easiest sub I've ever made. I'm like, you're welcome. But I, I'm just picky. I don't like a lot of stuff on my food because I just feel like you're messing up a good thing. So I, I like the basic things. And a few weeks ago, I went to uh, eat with a friend at this taco place, and they have amazing tacos, but they get a little creative. And I had been there with Nicole before, and I got a steak taco. Now, on their menu, their steak taco comes with steak, cheese, I'm cool, onions, meh. Corn salsa, meh. Jalapenos, meh. Green something, meh. Like, just things. And so I always get my tacos there. I want the steak taco with no onions. I want no jalapenos. I want no corn salsa. I want no this. I want no that. Finally, the waiter's like, so you want steak and cheese? Yes. Anybody who's ever been a waiter or waitress or you are a waiter or waitress, you're like, you're the worst customer ever. You're the person I can't stand. But I always tip well because I know that I'm hard to work with. So I went there with him, and he got these tacos, like a shrimp taco with a bunch of things on top of it that I can't, I, I can't pronounce. Then he got a, a pork taco with pineapple and a bunch of things on top of it that I can't pronounce. And when they brought it out, I, like internally, not externally because I'm not rude, but internally I'm like, like who puts pineapple with pork? I mean, who does that? Who does that? It's, it's, it's gross. So I'm like, this is terrible. Like, what is happening right now across from me? So I'm like sitting here eating my steak taco and everything. And, and he took a bite of the pineapple pork taco. And he was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And I'm like, whoa, this is the best taco I've ever had. And I'm like, man, this is a good taco. So it just changed his life, right? So when I went back with Nicole a few weeks later, She's like, hey, you're just going to get your basics, right? Now, we've been together for six years. I got to keep her on her toes. I don't want her knowing what I'm doing. Got to keep her guessing. So I was like, actually, no, I'm not. It's like, what you going to get? The, the pineapple pork taco and shrimp taco. She's like, what's this thing that's on the shrimp taco? I don't know. Wow, okay, this is cool. And so I'm petrified, right? Because I'm, I'm committed now, right? The only reason I got these tacos is because I want to keep her guessing. I don't want her to know what I'm doing. I'm kind of trying to keep her on her toes. It's not because I wanted it. So they bring it out, and I'm terrified the whole time, and I go, and I take a bite of the pineapple pork taco, and I'm like, oh my goodness. This is amazing. This changed my life. Like, this is like a heaven on earth experience in this moment. And we've been back two times since then, and every time I get the pork and pineapple taco and the shrimp with all these things that I can't pronounce. Now, I'm not getting crazy. Those are the only things I'm changing. I'm still getting my turkey and cheese on my sub. But I get these things, and Nicole laughs, and she's like, well, why'd you order it if you thought you wouldn't like it? I was like, no, I mean, I'm just trying something new, you know? And she was like, well, see, this is why I'm always telling you to kind of go outside the box. If you get away from things that you prefer, then you kind of find things that are good. Right? If you just do things that are a little different than what you're used to, then you find things are actually not as bad as you think. See, when it comes to our lives, the number one thing that prevents many of us from being used by God in the way he wants to use us is our unwillingness to let go of preferences. Our unwillingness to let go of the thing that we prefer, the way that we want it to be, the way that it's always been, the way that I've always known it. God wants to use us, but we have made up in our mind how it needs to be, and we're not willing to let go of it. And the first thing I need you to see is you got to let go of preferences. you got to let go of preferences. It said in verse number two, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. You have too many men. Now, if you're in a war, who does not prefer to have more warriors than you already have? Everybody would. And there's nothing wrong with that. Gideon wanted more men. Gideon did not go to God saying, hey, can you cut this 32,000 men down to 300? I really think that would help us. 
Gideon went to God because he's looking at the number of men that he has, and he's looking at the Midianite army of the enemy, and he's like, what I have is not enough to overcome that, and I would feel better, I would prefer to go into this battle with more men. But God said, no, you have too many men, because just because you prefer it does not mean that you need it. Just because it's what you prefer does not mean that it's what you need. God said, I know that you prefer to have more men, but guess what, Gideon? You need less. You need less. You prefer more, but you need less. He said, that thing that you want, that thing that you think that you need, that thing that you prefer is actually the very thing that you need to let go of. And many of us in our lives, our greatest preference is also our greatest hindrance. The thing that we prefer the most is the thing that is holding us back the most from seeing God work in our lives. Is it possible? Is it possible that the thing that you value the most is actually what's making you the weakest? Is it possible? No doubt Gideon was looking at these 32,000 men and he valued having soldiers. He valued soldiers in this army. If you're going to a battle against soldiers... What do you think you need? Soldiers. Now we're all spiritual. We're like, I just need the Lord by my side, my Bible, my worship music playing. I'm good. If you're going to a battle, you want the Lord, you want your Bible, you want the worship, but guess what else you want? You want people to fight the people you're going against. You prefer to have that. No doubt Gideon is preferring to have more than the 32,000 men that he has. But instead, God says, no, 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 no. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to give you 300. Because see, it was never how God intended to do it. And if Gideon would have held so tightly to what he wanted, what he thought he needed, what he preferred, then things would have ended completely differently. If he would have held so tightly to the way that he knew he was going to go. We have our lives lined up. We know how it's going to go. My kids are going to do this. My spouse is going to be this way. My church is going to do this. People at church are going to act this way. My pastor is going to do this. When I say to jump, he's going to jump and say how high. We're going to have all this figured out. We're going to, on my job, my boss is going to be this way. We have it all figured out. We have the way we prefer it. We have the way that we want it to go. And God steps in and he says, no, none of that's the way it needs to be. And so then we begin to feel as if we cannot do what God is calling us to do because he's taking away our preference. Somebody say preference. Somebody online type preference in the comments, like for real. Don't just be like, oh, I'm I'm acting like a... Type preference in the comments. We have our preferences and God's like, no, no, no. The way that you want it to go may not be the way it needs to go. Just because you prefer it does not mean that you need it. Just because you want it that way does not mean that God is going to do it that way. We tend to think, I don't have enough. This is what we say so often. I don't have enough in this season. I've said it far too many times. I don't have enough. We don't have enough. We want to do great things, but we don't have enough. Our go-to response is, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. But oftentimes, it's not that God needs to bring more, it's that he needs to take things away. We think that that the more we have of something, the stronger we are. But our strength is not found many times in what we add on. Our strength is found in what we're willing to let go of. Our strength is found in what we are willing to remove. We think our strength is in, if I could get this, if I could get that, if I had this, if I had that, if this worked out, if I had this, then I would be able to do what God's calling me to do. But many times, it's us being willing to strip things away out of our lives that has been hindering us from seeing God move the way that he wants to move. Some of us cannot go forward into what God has for us because we're not willing to let go of what we needed to leave behind. The very first thing that Gideon had to do before he went into this battle was not add more men. The first thing he had to do was remove some things. 
The first thing he had to do was let some things go. Get rid of the preference of more and embrace God's calling for less. God said, you don't, you got too many, Gideon. You got too many men. If you have this many men, you're going to start relying on them instead of relying on me. And so often we're looking to our source to give us a resource that we can put our faith in. And when we get the resource, our faith goes to the resource. So when the resource is gone, we no longer have the faith to do what God has called us to do. And the whole time God's up there saying, I tried to tell you you didn't need that thing. I tried to tell you it didn't have to be there. I tried to tell you I had the answer anyways, but I let you just dabble in that thing. Now you're seeing that's not enough. God said, I'm the only one who could provide the answer. I'll put it to you like this. When God opens a door in your life, be careful who you walk through the door with. Many times it's not as much about what door you're going through as it is who you're going through that door with. Gideon had 32,000 men. 32,000 that didn't know how to fight. 32,000 men that were not prepared the way they needed to be prepared. Were not prepared for the battle. And God knew that if all of them went forward with Gideon, then they would be weaker than they were if they were removed. Even, even in sports, they say it like this. They say, a team is only as good as the weakest link. In your life, you were only as strong as the weakest part. So we're constantly adding things. If I had more friends, if I had more influence, if I had more of this, if I had more of this, if I had more of that, then I would be able to. If I had more, if I had more. You never hear somebody say, I want less. You never hear somebody say, I want less friends. I want less money. I want less people. I want less volunteers. I want less. You never hear somebody say, I want less. Because in our minds, the more that we have, the stronger we are. The more that we have, the better we are. But God said, the more that's taken away, the stronger you'll actually become in me. Because instead of depending on them, you'll be depending on me. You know, some of the best, best messages, the most impactful messages that have happened in my life of, of preaching are the ones that I feel least prepared for. The ones that I literally have told Nicole, like, I'm nervous about today. I don't know how it's going to go. I can't recall anything that I've been studying. I've been studying all week. Same thing I've always done. And I can't recall none of it. What text am I using? Let me look in planning center. Like, I don't know. Like, I just can't recall it. Those are the best ones because I immediately say, God, Holy Spirit, if you ain't there, ain't nothing happening. I've got to have you. And that's the place God wants us to get to, the place where we don't have an answer in that person. We don't have an answer in that situation. We don't have an answer in that circumstance. But we're standing there saying, God, if you don't move, nothing's moving. God, if you don't do it, if you don't show up, nothing's changing. Nothing's getting better because I can't handle it. They don't have the answer. I can't handle it on my own. I've got to have you. And yet we, we still tend to be like, well, if I had more volunteers, if I had more resources, if I had more finances, and then because we don't have it, we feel disqualified. We feel Unable. We feel like we can't do what we need to do. We feel like we don't have what it takes, like we're not prepared, like we are not ready. And so we're like, well, God, I want to do what you've called me to do, but I need you to give me more of this in order to do it. God, I would love to serve you, and I will as soon as my prayer gets answered and I see the multiplication in that situation. Going around telling people, oh, you know, I'd love to serve, I'd love to help, but I just, I don't think that I'm there yet. I don't think I have what it takes. Once God enables me and gets me ready, then I'll be able to. And what God teaches us through Gideon here is that what holds you back and stops you is not what you don't have, but it's what you do have and don't value. I'm going to say that again for the people online. See, somebody fell asleep. If you're sitting next to somebody asleep, like, knock them off the rocker. What holds you back, what stops you, is not what you don't have. It's what you do have but do not value. 
Many of us have the answer that God has given us, but we don't recognize it as the answer because we're putting too low a value on that thing. We view the very thing that God sent to be a deliverance as invaluable. So many of the answers in our lives, so many of the promises in our lives are things that the world would tell you does not matter. It's things that the world would tell you has no value. It's things that you probably would tell yourself you have no value. Because a normal person would look at that thing and be like, that ain't worth nothing. 300? When I could have had 32,000? Like, let's be real, God. I really preferred 320,000. But 300? It's not valuable. It's not worth anything. And I wonder if you've ever looked at a person that God put into your life and wrote them off because they didn't look the part. My prayer is that God, no matter who comes through those doors, I don't care what they look like, I don't care what they smell like, where they've been, what they sound like, God, help us to see the purpose and the calling in each and every person's life. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. It doesn't matter their background. God will place people into your life that are called to be there for a purpose, that have so much value, but too often we look at them and we write them off because they don't look the way we thought they needed to look. If you're being crushed under a car and I'm the one that shows up, You may not feel too good, but me and God are a majority. So instead of being disappointed that I'm the one that showed up, maybe you start to pray, God, I pray you empower that dude right there because he don't look like he can do it. But God, I know that you can do all things. Instead of looking at it at face value for what we see, why don't we look behind it and see the God who is bringing it? Instead of writing things off as invaluable or as having no value, why don't we begin to see the the things that are invaluable in our lives? And that's the things that God sends, the people that God sends into our lives. See, the normal way is to look at it on the surface and see it for what what it is. And that's the reason we got to let go of normal. This next thing I want you to see this morning is let go of normal. We look at it on the surface. We look at it for what it looks like in that moment. But God says you got to let go of normal. Verse 7, the Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. With the 300 men that lapped, those people, that's the one God wants. I'm like, man, this is kind of, this is backwards. I'd want the people that are like going all in. Because if you're thirsty, if you're parched and you come to some water, what are you going to do? You're going to go all in. You're not just going to, I'm enjoying doing this actually. You're not going to do that. That's like the bougie way to do it. Like, that's how I drink my, what? Those people can't fight. I want the people that are savages, man. I want the people like going in, like, you know, going into the water. What I'm trying to say is that's the normal way. Not, it's not normal. It's not normal. But the ones who are not the ones that God had go forward. It was the ones who were doing it different. It was the ones who were doing it a little bit weird. See, just because it's normal does not mean that it's right. Just because it's normal to everyone else does not mean it's the right way for you to do it. And we are in a time where everything I hear people talk about is normal. Normal this, as if it's a place we need to get to. I just want to get back to normal. Anybody heard that? Show of hands, interaction, come on, life. Yeah, I want to get back to normal. Then this is, this is my favorite, the new normal. I'm embracing the new normal. I want to get back to normal. No, I'm embracing the new normal. Oh, well, new, nor- new normal is not for me. I want to get back to normal. Well, that normal is gone. We got to embrace the new normal. It's like all these normal things. I want to get back to normal. I want to embrace the new normal. I want this. I want. Can I tell you that God is not the God of normal? God is the God of weird. Let me just be 100%. God is the God of weird. If people have called you weird, thanks, God. 
God is the God of weird. He's not the God of normal. I don't want to get back to normal. I don't want to embrace the new normal. I want to be different. I want to be weird. I want to be the one that says, you know what, God? It may not make sense to anybody else, but if you call me to it, I'm going to go right through that door. God, it may not be understood by anyone else, but God, I'm stepping in to this thing that everybody else said was weird, that everybody else said doesn't make any sense, that everybody else said I was a little crazy for believing. God, that's where I want to live. I don't want to live in normal. God's not the God of normal. He's the God of weird. God will not call you to normal. He doesn't need to. That's where we live. The enemy will call you to normal because he would love nothing more than to put you into the confines of a box where everybody else can tell you how to live, what to do, where to go, how to behave. God is the God of weird. Somebody say, get weird. Get weird. It's okay. I know some people that God's all over their life because they're some of the weirdest people I've met. And I'm like, hey, I know that God had an extra touch on that. I'm one of them. God, thank you. They looked at me like I was crazy when I said I didn't like stuff all over my taco. Thanks, God. I ain't normal. I'm weird. All them people normal. But, But I'm just saying, God is saying, listen, I don't care about what everybody else is telling you to do. I don't care what everybody else is saying it needs to be like. I don't care what everybody else says is normal. I'm God. God said, normal people, Gideon, would tell you, yeah, you need about 150, 200,000 more men. Boop, there they are. But God said, I'm a little different. I'm weird. I don't work the way that everybody else works. I don't work in the way that they can figure out in their mind. I'm weird. So instead of adding to your group, I'm going to subtract from it. And I'm not just taking one or two. I'm taking the whole thing. Those 300 are just because I didn't want you to walk by yourself. I'm not really even going to do anything. I said, I'm the God of weird. I'm the God of weird. The ones who went forward were not the ones who did it the normal way. It was the ones who did it weird. And hear me when I say this, hear my heart on this. The people in your life who are trying to tie you down to normal, you need to let go of them. The people who are trying to keep you in that place of normalcy, the ones who make you feel guilty for believing God is greater. It's pretty selfish of you to think that God is able to protect you. Pretty selfish of you to think that God is able to keep you. The people that are making you feel guilty, feel bad about believing for great things from God, you need to let go of them. That's the last thing I need you to see this morning is let go of them. You gotta let go of your preferences. You gotta let go of normal and you gotta let go of them. Because the second part of verse seven, the Lord said to Gideon with 300 men that laughed, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Then watch this. Let all the others go home. Let all the others go home. God told Gideon, if you're going to win this battle, you're going to have to let some things go. If you're going to win this battle, you're going to have to stop holding on to everything that's there trying to tell you it needs to be different than what God said. Let them go. When it comes to your life and where God is taking you and the people that aren't supposed to go there, let them go. Let them go. Doesn't mean they're bad people. Doesn't mean they're the devil. I promise, man, church people, it's like anybody that's not being used by God in our life, it's like, oh, that's the enemy. No. Maybe they're just not supposed to be in your purpose, in your calling. Just because they leave your church doesn't mean they're your enemy. It's because they don't go there anymore doesn't mean you write them off for life. It means they're going somebody, go somewhere else because guess what? We're all part of the same family. We're all in the same thing. doesn't mean they're the devil just because they're not going forward with you, just because they're not moving forward with you. Doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means they're not supposed to go where God is taking you. And we have to become okay with that. We have to become okay in our minds with, okay, God, it's okay if you're taking me forward without that person. 
It's okay if you're taking me forward without that situation, without that thing that I used to lean on as a crutch. It's okay if you're taking me forward without this thing that I've grown comfortable with. It's okay that I'm going forward with this thing. Because at the end of the day, it's not really where you're going or how you're going there. It's about what you're willing to let go of to get there. What are you willing to let go of to get to the place where God is taking you? What are you willing to look at and to say, man, this was awesome for a season. This was great for a season. Gideon's like, I had these 32,000 men, and they helped a lot. But they weren't supposed to go forward to the Midianites with me. They weren't supposed to fight the Midianites with me. God said, you got to be okay with letting things go. Let them go home. See, in our minds, our staple response is always, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I need more. I'm going to do this thing. I need more. If I'm going to do this thing, I don't have enough. So God, I'm going to need an answer for you to do more. And what God is teaching us this morning, I believe, is that many of us have become so afraid of not having enough that we're holding on to things that he told us to let go of a long time ago. Many of us are so scared. I don't want to be on my own. I don't have to handle this all on my own. And we're trying to hold on to people and places and things that God told us to let go of a long time ago. He said it's over. And those things have taken precedence in our lives. Those things are now what we rely on. God said, if I allow the 32,000 to fight with you, Gideon, then y'all are going to think you did it. I don't just want partial credit. I want you to understand I'm the only one who has the answer. I want you to understand I'm the only one who can do this thing. So I got to remove some things so that I can step in and do what only I can do so that when you look back at your life, you don't say, oh yeah, look what we did. You look back and say, look at what God did. Look at the faithfulness of God. Look at when he was there for me when nobody else was. Look at when he was there for me when 22,000 left and went home because they didn't think I was a good enough leader and they were scared. Look at the ones who drank the water the wrong way. It's okay. Okay, because God said, I've got this. It's not about them. God said, I've got this. What relationship are you holding on to? What crutch are you holding on to? What, what comfort zone are you holding on to? What preconceived idea? Many of us are still holding on to the preconceived idea that we had for 2020. And the reason we think the whole year is wasted is because it's not going the way that we wanted to. But just because it's not how you want it doesn't mean that's not how it needed. And it doesn't mean that God cannot still redeem the time. It doesn't mean that God can't still redeem what was lost. It doesn't mean that God can't still redeem. We're holding on to so many preconceived ideas. I wanted it this way and that way and this way. And we're trying to force it and to make it work. It's like trying to put a square peg thing, whatever, through a round hole, whatever that phrase is. It's like we're trying to make stuff work where it shouldn't. God said, let those things go. Be bold and I will deliver you. Let all that stuff go. Let everything that you thought it needed to be like, you thought you needed more, really you needed less. When you don't have enough, when what you have isn't enough, it's not a time to quit. It's not a time to give up. It's not a time to go out of your way to try to force things to happen outside of the way God has called in your life for it to happen, it's the time to look at God and say, God, whatever it is, whatever it is you got to strip away from my life, God, whatever it is that you got to take away, do it. Do it. What an honest prayer it would be if instead of praying, God, I need more, we would begin to say, God, remove the things I've been depending on outside of you. God, remove the things that I've been relying on outside of you. Addictions, temptations, relying on a person to help us through. God, remove all of these things. Help me to rely solely on you and to know that no matter what it looks like, no matter if it seems like enough or if it doesn't, that you're just as faithful with little as you are with a lot. 